Hello, second grade. Happy Friday. You've made it a third week. Y'all are doing awesome. Today we are going to um, go ahead and check Spiral ELA with a colored pen. And we're also going to read out of Little House in the Big Woods, chapter four. Okay, we're gonna start and read half of chapter four. So if you do not have your ELA with you right now, and you don't have your book, please pause this video and go get your um, items right now, your materials, so you'll have them ready to go, okay? All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start working on Spiral ELA review. And my iPad is not cooperating today, so I'm just gonna do it this way, okay? So we'll get through it like this. All right, so we are going to check days four and five, okay? So the whole way across. All right, so on day four, I thought that depressed was more, had more intensity than sad or gloomy, okay? So when you're expressing, expressing an emotion, um, you wanna use a colorful word like depressed or even gloomy is pretty, I rated that as a number two, okay, as far as intensity goes. And then number three is sad. Sad's a pretty common word you hear a lot, but gloomy and depressed, not so much. All right, we're gonna move on across here, right here. Circle the antonym, underline the synonym, okay? You have fast, slow, quick. Slow is the opposite of fast, so that's gonna be your antonym, and quick is your synonym, the word that means the same as fast. Okay, next one over. Circle the transition word in the sentence. The last thing she did was hug me. Last is your transition word. It tells you when it happened. It's the last, the last thing she did. Okay, so that's your transition. Takes you from one time to another time. All right. The next one over says, choose the best way to improve the sentence. I think we need to combine these sentences because you have two complete sentences here. Mia ate pickles and cheese and then Mia ate chips and fries. So you have two sentences. You don't, Mia doesn't need expanding. We don't need to make it a bigger sentence. We just need to combine it and make it one sentence. So I wrote, Mia ate pickles and she ate chips and fries, or the sentence I like the best, Mia ate pickles, comma, cheese, comma, chips, comma, and fries. Those are words in a series, okay? I'm listing the words and they need commas after them, okay? All right, the next one is knock. Um, write the missing silent letter, K. Okay, we don't hear K and knock, but it is there. That is how you spell the word knock, like you're knocking on the door. All right, let's jump down to day five. First one. Order the adjectives with number one, two, three, according to intensity. All right, the first word I have is tiny. I rated that as a two. I rated many as one and little as three. I felt that many is the most intense word or the intense way that you can describe something being small. Kind of like a mini blizzard at Dairy Queen or a mini slush at Sonic, they're real small. All right, the next one over. Circle the antonym, underline the synonym. Afraid and scared are synonyms. They mean the same, but calm is the opposite of afraid or scared. Okay, so you should have circled calm and underlined scared. Circle the transition word in the sentence. Finally, Paul finished his work. It's almost like Paul's been working on, his, on it on something for a long time. So it's like finally he finished. Okay, it tells you when he finished. So finally is your word there that's and, um, circled. The next one, choose the best way to uh, improve the sentence. 
Um, this one we're going to expand. They have a little sentence here. It doesn't give us much information. It's not very, it's not very interesting to me. Games are fun. Okay, cool. Well, what else about games? Well, games are fun when you play them with your family. Okay, that's what I chose to write. So I expanded, I stretched that sentence out. I made it more interesting. That's what you should do in your narrative. Okay, stretch those sentences out. All right, the last one. Uh, write the missing silent letter in climb. It's a B. You don't hear the letter climb, but it is there when you spell it. So it's silent. All right, now I have a little treat for us today. We're gonna go outside and we're gonna read together. We're gonna do something a little bit different. We are reading chapter four of, it's a Christmas time um, where Laura lives. And Laura, we're gonna talk about Christmas with Laura's family. And I, as we read, I want you to think about how you feel connected to Laura and her family during the Christmas. I want you to recognize and, and have a connection with yourself, a connection to the world. Because um, the way she celebrates Christmas is very similar to some traditions that we do here in our, in our homes. And so I want you to make those connections with yourself and connections to the world, um, reading connections that we've talked about, text to self, text to world. Um, and think about the similar things that Laura and her family do that we also might do with our family. But also, I want you to think about differences. What, what are some different things that happen in this chapter that doesn't happen, that we don't do in our family at Christmas time? All right, well, let's go outside and let's get started with our next story. So we're outside. We're just going to do some fun reading out here where it's really beautiful outside today. Um, but in the story that we're about to read, it's going to be really cold. Okay, because this is Christmas time. And it's going to be really cold as we're going to find out next. Okay, here we go. We're on page 59. I am not, I'm not going to show you a PowerPoint today. I would like for y'all to read along with me. That is a good reading strategy to do. And so I want you to open your book to page 59 and follow along with me. Okay. Christmas. Christmas was coming. The little log house was almost buried in snow. Great drifts were banked against the walls and windows. And in the morning when Paul opened the door, there was a wall of snow as high as Laura's head. Paul took the shovel and shoveled it away, and then he shoveled a path to the barn where the horses and the cows were snug and warm in their stalls. Turn the page, page 60. The days were clear and bright. Laura and Mary stood on chairs by the window and looked out across the glittering snow at the glittering trees. Snow was piled all along their bare dark branches and it sparkled in the sunshine. Icicles hung from the eaves of the house to the snow banks. Great icicles as large at the top as Laura's arm. They were like glass and full of sharp lights. Wow, what great description. You can almost see those icicles sparkling in the sun. Paul's breath hung in the air like smoke. When he came along the path from the barn, he breathed it out in clouds and it froze in white frost on his mustache and beard. Talking about the breath, you know, when you walk out and it's really cold outside and you breathe and you see your breath, that's what they're talking about. And that froze his, his mustache because it was so cold. Every night he was busy working on a large piece of board and two small pieces. He whittled them with his knife, he rubbed them with sandpaper, and with the palm of his hand until when Laura touched them, they felt soft and smooth. Whittled means to kind of pick away wood with a knife and to shape something, carve something. Okay, carvers do that with wood, wood carvers. 
Um, so you might want to take it, you might take a stick and then you, with a knife, you whittle that top layer of wood away and then it's smooth underneath. Sandpaper makes things smooth. We're at the top of page 61. Then with his sharp jackknife, he worked at them, cutting the edges of the large one into little peaks and towers with a large star carved on the very tallest point. He cut little holes through the wood. He cut the holes in shapes of windows and little stars and crescent moons in circles. All around them, he carved tiny leaves and flowers and birds. One of the little boards he shaped in a lovely curve and around its edges, he carved leaves and flowers and stars. And through it, he cut crescent moons and curly cues. Wow, he's making beautiful designs on this wood. I bet it's a present, I bet it's a Christmas gift. Around the edges of the smallest board, he carved a tiny flowering vine. He made the tiniest shavings, cutting very slowly and carefully, making whatever he thought would be pretty. At last, he had the pieces finished, and one night, he fitted them together. When this was done, the large piece was a beautifully carved back for a smooth little shelf across its middle. Oh, so he's making a shelf. Okay, now we're at the top of page 62. The large star was at the very top of it. The curved piece supported the shelf underneath and it was carved beautifully too. And the little vine ran around the edge of the shelf. Paul had made this bracket for a Christmas present for Ma. He hung it carefully against the log wall between the windows and Ma stood her little china woman on the shelf. The little china woman had a china bonnet on her head and china curls hung against her china neck. Her china dress was laced across in front and she wore a pale pink china apron and little gilt china shoes. She was beautiful, standing on the shelf with flowers and leaves and birds and moons carved all around her and the very large star at the top. Ma was busy all day long cooking good things for Christmas. She baked salt rising bread and rye engine bread and Swedish crackers and a huge pan of baked beans with salt, pork, and molasses. She baked vinegar pies and dried apple pies and filled a big jar with cookies. And she let Laura and Mary lick the cake spoon. Hmm, that sounds like a connection that we might could relate to with Laura baking around Christmas time. One morning, she boiled molasses and sugar together until they made a thick syrup, and Paul brought in two pans of clean white snow from outdoors. And that's interesting. Laura and Mary each had a pan, and Paul and Ma showed them how to pour the dark syrup in little streams onto the snow. And that's what you see them doing in this picture right here, pouring molasses all over that snow. Hmm, I wonder what they're going to make. They made circles and curly cues and squiggly things. Turn the page. And these hardened at once and were candy. Laura and Mary might eat one piece, but the rest was saved for Christmas Day. All this was done because Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter and the cousins, Peter and Alice and Ella, were coming to spend Christmas. The day before Christmas came, Laura and Mary heard the gay ringing of sleigh bells, growing louder every moment, and then the big bobsled came out of the woods and drove up to the gate. Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter and the cousins were in it, all covered up under blankets and robes and buffalo skins. They were wrapped up in so many coats and mufflers and veils and shawls that they looked like big, shapeless bundles. Why do you think they were covered up so much? Well, they were traveling by wagon, if you remember. So it was cold when they, when they traveled. We have heaters in our cars, but they didn't have heaters back then. So it was really cold. So they really had to bundle up. So they had mufflers across their faces to block that cold air. And they had bells and shawls and even buffalo skin. The bottom of 64. When they all came in, the little house was full and running over. Black Susan ran out and hid in the barn, but Jack leaped in circles through the snow, barking as though he would never stop. Now there were cousins to play with. Top of page 65. As soon as Aunt Eliza had unwrapped them, Peter and Alice and Ella and Laura and Mary began to run and shout. 
At last, Aunt Eliza told them to be quiet. Then Alice said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go make pictures. Hmm. Alice said they must go outdoors to do it, and Ma thought it was too cold for Laura to play outdoors. But when she saw how disappointed Laura was, she said she might go after her. She put on Laura's coat and mittens and the warm cape with the hood and wrapped a muffler around her neck and let her go. Laura had never had so much fun. All morning, she played outdoors in the snow with Alice and Ella and Peter and Mary, making pictures. And the way they did it was this. Each one by herself climbed up on a stump, and then all at once, holding their arms out wide, they fell off the stumps into the soft, deep snow. They fell flat on their faces. Then they tried to get up without spoiling the marks they made when they fell through the beach. If they did it well, there in the snow were five holes shaped almost exactly like four little girls and a boy, arms and legs and all. They call these their pictures. So if you look at this page right here in your book, you notice that they fall forward or it tells us that they fall forward. It's like they go splat in the snow. This is kind of like us making snow angels, okay? Like when we fall backwards in the snow and make our arms go like this and our legs and we make a big snow angel. That's kind of what this reminds me of. That's a connection I made. Top of page 67. They played so hard all day that when night came, they were too excited to sleep, but they must sleep or Santa Claus would not come. So they hung their stockings by the fireplace and said their prayers and went to bed. Alice and Ella and Mary and Laura, all in one big bed on the floor. Peter had the trundle bed. Anna Eliza and Uncle Peter were going to sleep in the big bed, and another bed was made on the attic floor for Paul and Ma. I remember, they did not have a big house or anything. They did not have a lot of room. So they only had maybe two rooms back then. The buffalo robes and all the blankets had been brought in from Uncle Peter's sled, so there were enough covers for everybody. Paul and Ma and Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter sat by the fire talking, and just as Laura was drifting off to sleep, she heard Uncle Peter say, hey, he's about to tell a story. Eliza had a narrow squeak the other day when I was away at Lake City. You know, Prince, that big dog of mine? Laura was wide awake at once. Turn the page. She always liked to hear about dogs. She lay still as a mouse and looked at the firelight flickering on the long walls and listened to Uncle Peter. Well, said Uncle Peter, early in the morning, Eliza started to the spring to get a pill of water and Prince was following her. She got to the edge of the ravine where the path goes down to the spring and all of a sudden, Prince set his teeth in the back of her skirt and pulled. You know what a big dog he is. Eliza scolded him, but he wouldn't let go. And he's so big and strong, she couldn't get away from him. He kept backing and pulling till he tore a piece out of her skirt. It was my blue print, Aunt Eliza said to Ma. Dear me, Ma said. He tore a big piece right out of the back of it. Aunt Eliza said. I was so mad I could have whipped him for it, but he growled at me. Prince growled at you, Paul said. Yes, said Aunt Eliza. So then she started on again toward the spring, Uncle Peter went on, but Prince jumped into the path ahead of her and snarled at her. He paid no attention to her talking and scolding. He just kept on showing his teeth and snarling. And when she tried to get past him, and he kept in front of her and snapped at her. That scared her. I should think it would, Ma said. He was so savage, I thought he was going to bite me, said Aunt Eliza. I believe he would have. Savage means um, he was very protective, very unsure of strangers as he should be. He's a watchdog. And so he was usually friendly with the family. And so this confused Eliza. She didn't understand why he was being this way towards her. So we're going to find out why though. Turn the page. The top of page 70. 
I've never heard of such a thing, said Ma. What on earth did you do? I turned right around and ran into the house where the children were and slammed the door, Aunt Eliza answered. Of course, Prince was savage with strangers, said Uncle Peter. But he was always so kind to Eliza and the children. I felt perfectly safe to leave them with him. Eliza couldn't understand it at all. After she got into the house, he kept pacing around it and growling. Every time she started to open the door, he jumped at her and snarled. Had he gone mad? said Ma. That might mean that he had rabies. That's what I thought, Aunt Eliza said. I didn't know what to do. There I was, shut up in the house with the children and not daring to go out. And we didn't have any water. I couldn't even get any snow to melt. Every time I opened the door so much as a crack, Prince acted like he would tear me to pieces. How long did this go on? Paul asked. All day till late in the afternoon, Aunt Eliza said. Peter had taken the gun or I would have shot him. Along late in the afternoon, Uncle Peter said, he got quiet and lay down in front of the door. Eliza thought he was asleep and she made up her mind to try to slip past him and get to the spring for some water. So she opened the door very quietly, but of course he woke up right away. When he saw she had the water pail in her hand, he got up and walked ahead of her to the spring, just the same as usual. And there all around the spring in the snow were the fresh tracks of a panther. The tracks were as big as my hand, Santa Lot said to Aunt Eliza. Yes, Uncle Peter said. He was a big fellow. His tracks were the biggest I ever saw. He would have got Eliza sure if Prince had let her go to the spring in the morning. Turn the page. I saw the tracks. He had been lying up in that big oak tree over the spring, waiting for some animal to come there for water. Undoubtedly, he would have dropped down on her. Wow, so what was Prince doing? Sounds to me like he was protecting Aunt Eliza, wasn't he? He knew that panther was there and he knew that if she went to the spring, she could be in danger. So he was being a really good dog. Okay, second paragraph, page 72. Night was coming on when she saw the tracks and she didn't waste any time getting back to the house with her pail of water. Prince followed close behind her, looking back into the ravine now and then. I took him into the house with me, Aunt Eliza said, and we all stayed inside till Peter came home. Did you get him? Paul asked Uncle Peter. No, Uncle Peter said. I took my gun and hunted all around the place, but I couldn't find him. I saw some more of his tracks. He'd gone on north, farther into the big woods. Alice and Ella and Mary were all wide awake now, and Laura put her head under the covers and whispered to Alice. Ma, weren't you scared? Alice whispered back that she was scared, that Ella was scared. Top of page 73. And Ella whispered that she wasn't either any such thing. Well, anyway, you made more, more fuss about being thirsty, Alice whispered. There they lay whispering about it till Ma said, Charles, those children never will get to sleep unless you play for them. So Paul got his fiddle. The room was still and warm and full of firelight. Ma's shadow and Aunt Eliza's and Uncle Peter's were big and quivering on the walls in the flickering firelight and Paul's fiddle sang merrily to itself. What description there? Do you hear all the description, how they're describing things, how they describe this story about Prince? And all the wonderful words they used and flickering firelight, their shadows were flickering. So this book is full of description, boys and girls, and full of connections that we can make to ourselves. Laura experienced some things that we still experience today. Let's keep reading. It sang Money Musk and the Red Heifer, the Devil's Dream and Arkansas Traveler. And Laura went to sleep while Paul and the fiddle were both softly singing. My darling Nellie Gray, they have taken you away and I'll never see my darling anymore. 
All right, boys and girls, we're going to stop there at the bottom of page 73. That's about half of chapter four. Mrs. Patterson will pick that back up next week, um, I believe on Monday. And uh, I just want to remind you, I hope you're well into writing your narrative and you can work on that over the weekend as well. And um, you have a coronavirus journal to begin that you should have begun today. I really think that's going to be a great res resource later on for somebody who can come along and read your journal. You have a chance at writing a primary source firsthand from something you experienced that you can tell people about what you, because you're experiencing history right now, history in the making. And though it's a sad time for our country, um, it's also a very important time, and I think it's worth writing about Miss Patterson, and I feel that it's worth it, um, and I think you'll be glad to have it. All right, boys and girls, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Get outside. It's a beautiful day. Go play. Get some energy out. Exercise, and we will see you next week. All right. Bye.